good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the Standing Committee on Social Development, Bill 40 and 41. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order before we start. Uh, I've asked Mr. Blake to open up with a prayer. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Lord, for this day. May many more come. We thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you watch over our family and constituents, wherever they may be. We ask all this in your holy and precious name, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Uh, review the agenda. We have a public hearing on Bill 40 and 41. Can I have a mover? Move by Julie. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, welcome to the, our meeting of the Standing Committee on Social Development. Before we begin, I will ask uh, my colleagues to introduce themselves, uh, starting on my left. Ms. Good evening, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Welcome. Julie Green, Yellowknife Centre. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Michael Medley, MLA for Detchel. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Uh, Shane Thompson, the Hende. Uh, on my left is uh, Allison Anderson. She's our community advisor. And on my right is Jennifer Frankie Smith, a community clerk, and Cynthia James is clerk in training. Um, today, the Standing Committee on Social Development is holding a public hearing on Bill 40, Smoking Control and Reduction Act, and Bill 41, Tobacco and Vapor Products Control Act. The Standing Committee on Social Development is a committee of regular members of the Legislative Assembly. The bills are bills we are reviewing today were introduced by the Minister, given first and second reading in the Legislative Assembly, then referred to the Standing Committee for review. Legislation is typically brought forth by Cabinet and is reviewed by the Standing Committee. The members of this committee were are responsible for holding government to account and one of the ways we do this is by making sure that proposed laws are supported by the people of Northwest Territories. It is our responsibility to consult with residents on what they like and don't like about the bills. We would like to hear your views and comments which will be used by the committee to identify any changes we'd like to see made to draft legislation in which we will then report back to our colleagues in the Assembly. The Standing Committee sent out stakeholder letters requesting input on the bills. Tonight we are holding a public meeting in Yellowknife. We then report back to the Legislative Assembly on proposed legislation during the upcoming August or the sitting here of the Legislative Assembly. I wish to briefly discuss or describe the intent of these bills. Bill 40, Smoking Control and Reduce Reduction Act, repeals the Cannabis Smoking Control Act and replaces it with a new act. It also replaces some of the provisions of the Tobacco Control Act. The new act proposes to amend territorial legislation on tobacco and smoke, smoking controls to respond to changes in the federal law addressing the, the continued use and normalization of tobacco, a, a ban on methyl methyl cigarettes and new technology, i.e. e-cigarettes and vaping. The Act creates prohibitions and offenses for smoking in public places and for smoking with a minor present in a motor vehicle. It also makes it also makes requirements for displaying signs respecting the health risks associated with or displaying the signs respecting the health risks associated with smoking. Bill 41, Tobacco and Vapor Products Control Act, repeals and replaces the Tobacco Control Act. The bill creates prohibition and offenses for the sale and supplies and displays of tobacco products, vapor products, accessories, or prescribed substance or product. Establishing requirements for the displays of signs for the legal age to produce products, accessories, or substance. Automatic prohibition for the storage of the product in a place where offenses have been committed and displays displaying of a sign for the prohibition in place and enforcing of the bill and any regulatory regulations under it. There are copies of the bills at the cited table. Please help yourself. If you would like to share your views with us today, please let the clerk know. We will sure to add you to the list. We are also accepting written submissions by postal mail and emails until February or till 
Friday, June 12, 14, 2009 at 5 p.m. One pedal, final piece of housekeeping. Please re remember that all submissions will be part of official committee records and, be, and may be reflected on our final report. Any submissions made during this meeting may also be televised or broadcast via social media. Thank you, everybody, for your patience and allowing me with this introduction. With members agreement, we can now open the floor to comments from the public. Do members agree? Agreed. Okay, we'll start with Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm pleased to be here tonight to discuss Bill 40, Smoking Control and Reduction Act, and Bill 41, the Tobacco and Vapor Products Control Act. There are a number of people joining me. Dr. Cami Candola, who's the Chief Public Health Officer. Laura Jeffrey, who helped, uh, who is our Legislative Counsel. Natasha Brotherston, who's the Director of Policy and Legislation. Colette Perry, who is the Manager of Policy and Legislation. Heather Ruptash, who is the Senior Policy Officer. And Susan Laramie, who you all know as my Ministerial Special Advisor. And I'd like to just sort of, I think there was a little bit of confusion. Normally a Minister wouldn't attend at this stage. They would usually attend after you've concluded your public hearings uh, prior to the, the clause by clause. Um, so there was a little bit of confusion. Um, I think it's important that you hear from the people that are here tonight um, and, and do your public meeting. I know that I'll be coming back uh, for another meeting when we actually do the clause by clause. So uh, given that I'm here, I will just do a brief introduction. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, we'll get out of your way uh, and we'll have further discussions later after you've concluded your public hearings and had your discussion. So I, I apologize for that confusion. Uh, Hopefully we'll we'll be able to move through this, and I look forward to having further discussion at another time. So, Mr. Chair, Bill 40, the Smoking Control and Reduction Act, is intended to protect the public, particularly children and youth, from a variety of secondhand smoke exposure and vaping aerosol. Bill 40 would repeal the Cannabis Smoking Control Act and replace it with comprehensive legislation that restricts public areas where smoking is permitted to deter uptake and reduce the normalization of smoking. To protect the public's health, prohibiting the general act of smoking any substance is more effective than trying to distinguish between which product is actually being used. Under this bill, this prohibition would include tobacco products, vapor products, cannabis, and anything else intended to be smoked or inhaled. In order to protect children and youth from secondhand smoke exposure and vaping aerosol, the Smoking Control and Reduction Act would also prohibit smoking in a motor vehicle when a minor is present. Currently, the NWT is the only one of two jurisdictions that do not yet prohibit this, and as a note, there was a motion passed in this Legislative Assembly directing us to do this, and we are responding to the motion. Bill 40 provides an exception for traditional Indigenous spiritual or cultural practices or ceremonies with the consent of the manager of the public place. It also allows municipal councils to further restrict smoking in public places and rev revenue incurred from fines for ticketed offense that take place under community bylaws would remain in the community. Mr. Chair, Bill 41, the Tobacco and Vapor Products Control Act, would repeal the existing Tobacco Control Act and replace it with a new modern piece of legislation that regulates and restricts access to tobacco products, vapor products, as well as accessories. To assist with this, the bill proposes to restrict access to these items by setting a legal age of purchase of 19, resulting in a consistent framework for, consistent framework for regulated substances in the Northwest Territories, in, including cannabis and alcohol. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, uh, many of us know the harmful effects of tobacco use, but vaping also exposes users to harm, harmful chemicals, and many young people don't know that they're actually inhaling nicotine. A single pod used in vaping devices can expose the user to the same amount of nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. Uh, nicotine is highly addictive and can be harmful, have harmful impacts on the brain, affecting memory and concentration in everyone, and brain development in youth and young adults. Early exposure to nicotine in adolescence may increase the severity of future dependence to nicotine and tobacco. Uh, restricting access to these items will assist in our efforts to deter the uptake of tobacco and vaping in the Northwest Territories, encouraging individuals to quit using these items and to denormalize smoking and prevent early initiation of adolescents to these addictive products and substances. Lastly. The department is proposing to prohibit the sale of food products and confectionery that resemble tobacco, vapor products, 
or accessories, and it is argued that these products promote youth uptake and normalize use of tobacco and vapor products. Mr. Chair, these bills will not come into force until regulations have been finalized and the Department is currently working to draft some regulations. Should these bills pass third reading, the government expects to be able to bring these bills into force early in the 19th Legislative Assembly. And I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have now, or I'm also happy to, to leave the desk, leave the table, and turn it over to any other public hearings and answer questions that you may have at our next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Abernethy. Any questions for Mr. Abernethy? Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm wondering if the minister has an implementation plan for this act that he could share with the committee at some point. Minister Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I indicated, the, before this act can go live, we need to complete the regulations. The department will be working on those regulations. We don't know what every one of those is going to look like because there may be amendments, and I anticipate following our normal process, there may be some amendments to the legislation. Uh, but we're hoping to go live with this, which includes communication plan, uh, working with making sure that people understand it, understand the legislation and the regulations in the early in the 19th Assembly. Mr. Abernathy, Ms. Green. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that explanation. Um, uh, if you have a, an implementation plan, which I, I recognize may not um, have all the pieces complete at this time, but if you have a plan for when you're going to finish the regulations, comms plan, and so on and so forth, is do you have one? And if you do, could you share it with the committee? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Ms. Minister Abernathy. We haven't developed a comprehensive communication plan that will be done once the legislation is completed as part of the rollout in the 19th Assembly. Uh, our priority right now is to get the legislation passed and then begin developing the regulations and conclude developing the regulations, which will actually set the tone of, of it, how we communicate the information and get it out into the public. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry I'm not making myself clear. Uh, what I'm asking for is an implementation plan of the bill. This is, bill is going to ha make a difference to the public, to retailers, to uh, municipalities, to all kinds of people. And so I'm wondering if you have an implementation plan, and, and if so, can you share it with us? And if not, are you creating one? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Abernathy. I thought I was pretty clear. We haven't developed a comprehensive communications plan or an implementation plan because it is dependent on the nature of the regulations. The nature of the regulations will be determined through the process that we're going through. We have a bill in front of us. We anticipate committee will likely have some suggested amendments. We will discuss those. We will work together to make a strong bill. Once we know the nature of the bill, we'll be in a better position to articulate exactly how long the regulations are going to take, which will set our implementation plan. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Any other questions from Minister Abernathy? Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So the, the regulation making that's going to take place under the bill, um, um, is there any kind of public consultation process? Do you guys, like some jurisdictions might gazette a regulation or uh, provide for a period of public comment? Uh, look, I support what you're doing here, and I want to see it done as quickly as we can. But uh, I'm just wondering, how do you see the, the regulation making rolling out? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Aberna. Uh, a number of things. Obviously, we'll need to look at best practices in other mm -hmm. jurisdictions. We are waiting to see what the federal government is doing. They're moving forward with, uh, with some legislation in this area as well. We want to make sure that we're not too far out of step with what they're proposing and what they're going to be doing. Uh, we'll certainly be needing to talk to vendors and other you know, organizations that may have an interest in this to make sure that we are on track. And bottom line is we will and have to maintain consistent with our legislation, uh, but we will certainly be, be talking to stakeholders and development of the regulations. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Mr. Riley. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that and um, just want to urge you to get on with us as quickly as you can. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Any other questions for Minister Abernathy? Seeing none, Minister Abernathy, closing comments before? I imagine we'll make closing comments when we actually have our next meeting. But, I mean, to, to Member O'Reilly's point, I get it. I want to have this done as soon as possible. It would be nice to have it done in the life of this government. But I think practically, uh, given the amount of days available to us before, before the next writ, uh, I don't anticipate we're getting done. But the Department's committed to getting this done uh, 
coming early in the life of the next assembly. Thank you, Minister Abernathy. Uh, you and your staff can leave or stay if should they wish. Some of the staff will just stay behind. I'm going to leave, but I'll see you again when we get to the next round. Okay. Thank you, Minister Abernathy, and thank you for your time, and thank you for your staff. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, Jules Lab. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, oh, no, uh, come on up to the... Yeah. 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 My name okay. is Melissa Foster. I'm the head of the labs. Okay, thank you. And your uh, colleague? Chris Harris. Chris Harris? Okay. Thank you very much. So, this is the witness part of the public meeting, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair and committee members, for the opportunity to join today. Uh, it is our pleasure to be in Yellowknife this evening to speak about the importance of harm reduction, lowering the rates of chronic disease, and getting people off of cigarettes. As I am sure everyone here is uh, very well aware, cigarette-related illnesses place a huge burden on the Canadian healthcare system and on Canadians uh, independently, uh, both in loss of life and in terms of healthcare costs. Burned tobacco cigarettes cost Canada over uh, $17 billion per year. And of course, the Northwest Territories is no exception, um, with smoking rates sitting at the highest, second highest in the country. An extremely high number of traditional smokers creates long-standing challenges uh, for health policymakers as rates of chronic disease increase and the associated financial burden on the healthcare system rises along with it. So Juul Lab's goal is to find a way to use vaping technology to provide existing smokers with a satisfying alternative to combustible cigarettes. Um, created as a harm reduction product, Juul Labs is committed to impacting the lives of the world's 1 billion adult smokers by eliminating cigarettes, which is the leading cause of preventable death worldwide. This product is for adult smokers only and should absolutely be kept out of the hands of youth and non-smokers. Um, and again, as many of us are aware, it's incredibly hard for people to stop smoking. While 70% of adult smokers claim they want to quit, uh, the average smoker will attempt to quit over 30 times before successfully quitting uh, for about one year. Any tools that can reduce the reliance on tobacco should be considered as useful in the fight against tobacco usage. And if used properly, vapor products can be such a tool. And in fact, Health Canada has stated that vaping is less harmful than smoking. And provincial regulations are critical in converting adult smokers. A study on electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS, policy showed a less restrictive environment is important for sustaining smoking abstinence in smokers who used ENDS products for the purposes of cessation. Juul products contain nicotine, just like patches or gum, but nicotine, while very addictive, is not directly responsible for the cancers that are commonly associated with cigarette use. It's the harmful ingredients in the combustible smoke. So we understand that some of the regulatory measures under consideration in Bill 41 seek to place significant restrictions on the sale, promotion, and display of vapor products. And as such, we ask the Territory to consider the impact of these restrictions on helping adult smokers make the switch to non-combustible products. In order to encourage smokers to switch from smoking to vaping, there is a significant benefit to allowing advertising that can reach smokers in the moment when they are making a purchase decision. In-store display can help adult smokers by clearly presenting them with a less harmful option or a less harmful alternative to the cigarettes that they were intending to purchase when they walked in. As most recently seen in Quebec, a total ban limits an individual's ability to access a harm reduction product, and they are actually now looking to amend uh, the existing legislation that they had put in place on this. Jewel, Lands, uh, Jewel Labs strongly supports the limitation of point of sale advertising to remove any bright colors or any features that could appeal to youth, but does not support a blanket prohibition on um, point of sale advertising. In fact, we believe that such a total prohibition on uh, advertising or communication to adult smokers would actually hurt the objective to further reduce rates of smoking and reduce the prevalence of chronic disease. Uh, we believe that there exists a compromise where both youth prevention and adult smoking uh, reduction objectives can be met. 
And additionally, uh, Bill 41 seeks to ban the sale of vapor products from pharmacies uh, across the Northwest Territories under the supervision of a responsible medical practitioner, like a pharmacist. We believe the risk of youth purchasing the product is in fact very low. Um, given that harm reduction value of e-cigarettes, we believe that this could seriously limit the opportunity for adult smokers to successfully make the switch to a less harmful product. ENDS can be a valuable tool for pharmacists operating within a smoking cessation program, and we have seen this done quite successfully throughout British Columbia. Like many new and immature product categories, there are many non-compliant and counterfeit vapor products in the Canadian market today. These unregulated products, which are sold both online and in physical stores, are unlawful, made with unknown and potentially hazardous chemicals, and have unregulated quality standards. They also often target youth with promotions, packaging elements, and flavors currently disallowed by Health Canada, and with prohibited um, nicotine content. These products undermine public health and all of our efforts to keep e-cigarettes and vaping products like Juul out of the hands of youth. Canadian consumers need to be well informed about the vaping products they are purchasing. Point of sale advertising for vaping products is a means of helping consumers make informed purchasing choices, while prohibiting it could have a similar negative effect on the health and safety of Canadians by allowing for more rapid proliferation of the counterfeit and compatibles market. Companies like Juul Labs are already severely limited um, in their ability to communicate with consumers, um, and the removal of all point of sale advertising will only make this problem worse. So it's crucial that all regulatory measures captured in Bills 40 and 41 reflect both the territory's primary objectives, of course, to limit youth and non-smoker uptake of vaping products, while realizing their harm reduction potential by converting current adult smokers completely away from combustible cigarettes. Uh, we recognize that smoking alternatives continue to be the subject of much debate, and we welcome ongoing dialogue. Uh, we also look forward to continued collaboration uh, with you and other public health partners to showcase the company's commitment uh, to be a smoking alternative for Canadian adult smokers. Um, at this time, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Um, before you get on to the questions, can we get a copy of your presentation? Of course. And this just echoes um, the submission that we have previously submitted um, that I believe was circulated throughout the committee. So nothing was said today that's not in that submission as well. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Foster. Uh, committee? Any questions? No questions? Ms. Foster, Mr. Harris, thank you very much for your time and making your presentation. Uh, and again, if you have any more written submissions, we have that opportunity to submit to us. Okay, thank you. Ms. Martins, Martins, is it Martin? Martin. Martins? Martins. Martins. Ms. Martin, Martins. Um, my name is Fernanda Martins, and I am a healthcare policy analyst located in Yellowknife with the Canadian Cancer Society Prairie Division. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate in this hearing today. Um, the Canadian Cancer Society commends the government for all the steps it has taken to modernize its tobacco legislation. We support the bills. Um, that we are reviewing today, but do you have some recommendations for some amendments? 
In the 13 years since the Tobacco Control Act was enacted, new proven measures to prevent initiation, encourage cessation, and protect individuals from exposure to tobacco smoke have been identified and implemented in many other jurisdictions. The people of the Northwest Territories no longer have to be left behind when it comes to protecting their health from the harm caused by commercial tobacco. This government has the opportunity now to offer our citizens the best and most up-to-date protection that they deserve. Even since our original submission uh, to the, the government in March of 2017 when the public engagement process began, the landscape of tobacco control has continued to shift and evolve with the advent of the legalization of e-cigarettes containing nicotine and the legalization of cannabis in Canada. Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold, so my throat's a bit... Okay. <clears throat> Recent lessons that have been learned as a result need to be included in our new legislation to protect our youth. This timing requires the government of the Northwest Territories to be a bold leader. I urge the committee to remember that lives are at stake when it is deliberating whether or not to recommend amendments that include additional available proven measures in the new legislation. The leading consideration must be the health of the public. We have been paying and will continue to pay an untenable price for the many past decades of decisions to be permissive and yielding to pressure from the tobacco industry to allow it to continue its business of addicting people to its product that ruins health and ends lives prematurely with gruesome suffering. Too many of us have endured or witnessed the suffering. Smoking tobacco is by far the leading cause of cancer. If I can just draw your attention to the first tab in the... <clears throat> It uh, might be easier to reel if you just take this thing apart. <laughs> it's really wedged in there. Um, uh, it, it's, there's a t the table there um, indicates um, in the purple uh, blocks which uh, types of cancer are um, caused by smoking tobacco and also from secondhand smoke. Uh, you'll see that bladder, breast, cervical, colorectal, esophageal, gallbladder, laryngeal, oral, kidney, liver, lung, ovarian, pancreatic, stomach, and ureter cancer is, is caused by tobacco. With 32,700 new cases due to smoking tobacco in... Tw I'll just repeat that. Smoking tobacco is the leading cause of cancer with 32,700 new cases due to smoking tobacco in 2015 alone. And 2015 is, is the most recent data available. Uh, these findings were uh, published in the Canadian Population Attributable Risk of Cancer Study on the Preventable Burden of Cancer in Canada. The study projects that if the current trend continues, the number of new cancer cases due to smoking tobacco will increase to 46,900 for the year of 2042. These are cancer cases that are entirely preventable. As these cancer cases are preventable, the study projects that 50,000, that over 50,000 cancer <coughs> cases that could be, prevent, could be prevented by 2042 if more Canadians quit or did not start smoking. That number is, is higher than the total population of our territory. With regard to the territory, um, and I'll see so if you flip the page, um, the, the diagram on the second page indicates um, the leading role that tobacco takes in uh, causing preventable cancer cases. It is three times higher than the second cause of, of cancer. So. Um, and if you turn the page, um, you'll see uh, a breakdown for the three territories together that we're included in. And of course, the numbers are so far lower there because, because of our smaller populations. But again, it indicates that tobacco is by far the leading cause of cancer in the territories. Uh, 
in the territory, the um, annual report of the Northwest, Northwest Territories Health and Social Services System, which was published in 2018, indicates that the rate of avoidable death is higher in the territory than in Canada at 20.2 per 10,000 versus 13 per 10,000 per Canada. Consumption of tobacco in the territory has been stubbornly high, and these stubborn consumption rates demonstrate an urgency for strong legislative enhancement. The Public Performance Measures Report of 2016, published in October 2016, indicated that 32.5 of the Northwest Territories population aged 12 and over reported that they were daily or occasional smokers, which was higher than the national rate of 18.5. Between 2003 and 2014, there had not been any significant changes in the Northwest Territory smoking rate, whereas the national rate had decreased from 23.4 to 18.5% over the same period. Since that report, the 2018 Northwest Territories Tobacco, Alcohol and Drug Survey has been conducted and published. And if you look at tab, at tab two, I hope you will find the statistics which is missing from my tab. So these are the recently published uh, statistics which have not, uh, um, there's no analysis uh, published along with them, but you will see that the rate has Rather than declining, the rate has increased to 33.4% compared to the current smoking prevalence of 16% nationally. While the rest of Canada makes progress in reducing the number of smokers, the NWT continues to be left behind. Within the territory, there are also significant differences between the regions. And if you turn the page over... You will see... Oh, thanks very much. Um, you will see uh, by region, if you compare Yellowknife to um, the Beaufort Delta, for instance, in Yellowknife we have a, a smoking rate of 22.4, whereas in the Beaufort Delta it's all the way up to 51.4. Huge difference. Uh, the region's 34.6%, Satu 44.9%, South Slave 40.9%, Tlicho 426 These are completely unacceptable rates of tobacco consumption. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Decisive, bold action must be taken to improve these disparities. This government must not shrink away from being the trailblazer it once was in setting an example for the rest of the country as it did at the time of enacting the Tobacco Act in place right now. Legislation that creates an environment where youth have less access to tobacco, where smokers who are trying to quit are supported, and where fewer people are exposed to tobacco smoke and smoking behavior will play a significant role in the prevention of cancer cases and other chronic disease which curtails the lives of our citizens. Uh, we're proposing an amendment to the bills with regard to the definition of minor, as it appears uh, in the definition section, but as it relates to Section 5 of Bill 41. Although the legislation is headed in the right direction with the increase to the age of the purchase of tobacco from 18 to 19, uh, and also for the purchase of vapor products, it's not going far enough, and a strong opportunity to reduce access by youth to these products is being lost. We urge the committee to recommend that the definition of minor be changed to mean an individual who has not attained 21 years of age. And I know the word minor um, may pose a problem there because we, we have a definition for minor outside of the Act, but however it needs to be uh, changed. Um, in, in the 2015 report, the U.S. Institute of Medicine concluded that increasing the minimum tobacco sales age to 21 
would reduce smoking by 25% among 15 to 17 year olds and 15% among 18 to 9 year olds. Increasing the minimum legal age for tobacco products to 21 reduces tobacco use among youth. The vast majority of tobacco users start as youth or young adults and young people are aggressively targeted by the tobacco industry. I uh, don't know if there's any f smokers or former smokers in this room, but the majority of people have started smoking when they're young, young teenagers and uh, have a very difficult time stopping once they've started. Increasing the minimum legal sale age for tobacco products to 21 reduces tobacco use among youth. The vast majority, I'm sorry, I said that. Further, as young smokers obtain cigarettes, most commonly from social sources, increasing the legal age of sale to age 21 would make it more difficult for underage smokers to gain access to cigarettes from older youths who would be, who would be less likely to remain in the same social networks after high school. Children have typically received their tobacco from somebody slightly older who can go in and who has is of legal age to purchase and supply that tobacco to them. If, if um, the difference in age is more than just one year, you're going to increase your chances of removing access to tobacco and vapor products from children. In the United States, there's a tremendous momentum to increase the minimum age to purchase to the age of 21. As of May, if the, as, as of now, 14 states and hundreds of cities or municipalities have adopted tobacco age 21. Currently, the Yukon Territory is consulting with the public on increasing the age to age 21. And with regard to vaping products, 14 states and more, more states are coming online. And the United States, the major tobacco and vaping companies, including Philip Morris, Reynolds, American, Juul, and Blue, have been supporting minimum age 21 laws. In March 12th, on March 12th, 2019, Juul urged Quebec to increase the minimum age for vaping products to 21. So as the bills cover both vaping and tobacco, it, see, it makes sense to have the age the same for both products. The Northwest Territories should pass, sorry. If the Northwest Territories should pass on this important health measure, given the high smoke and re smoking rates, <coughs> I'm sorry. Me. The Northwest Territories should not pass on this important health measure given the high smoking rates among the youth. The sooner the measure is implemented, the more tobacco we can keep out of the hands, or more to the point, the lungs, of our youth, and the greater the opportunity to prevent a lifetime of nicotine addiction, future disease, and premature death. Someone has to be the first to take this step in Canada. With the second highest tobacco consumption rates in the country that are refusing to budge, there's no better candidate than the Northwest Territories to take that first step. With regard to vaping, we urge the committee not to pull back on any of the regulations as they're drafted. Um, my colleague will be uh, addressing the significance of the vaping issue, but I also include at page, sorry, tab three. Um, with our original uh, submission we made in cooperation with the Heart and Stroke Society and um, they have produced this document which uh, does a very thorough job of outlining the issues around uh, vaping. And they, I don't know if you see that photograph with the um, pencils and the, and the bag. Those little, those little things that look like pencil sharpeners, those are vaping devices. Um, they indicate that while in the public health community 
While many of the public health community recognize the potential cessation and harm reduction benefits of the e-cigarettes, there are many unknowns about the products, long-term safety and gateway potential for a new generation of tobacco and nicotine users. There is also concern that e-cigarettes could renormalize smoking and those products with nicotine could promote dual use and perpetuate <coughs> nicotine addiction instead of encouraging full cessation, thus undermining tobacco control efforts. E-cigarette use in public places has the potential to renormalize smoking and serve as a type of marketing and promotion for the products. A 2018 survey found that 86% of people in Canada support banning e-cigarette use for minors. About a third of respondents felt that e-cigarettes were doing more harm than good, and another third felt that the harm and good was balanced. Only 14% believed e-cigarettes were doing more harm, were doing more good than harm, sorry. Uh, page, at uh, tab four, there's a statement from the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health on the increasing rates of youth vaping in Canada, expressing their concern. Uh, that there is an alarming number of youth vaping in Canada. It calls on governments to address the issue. Governments at all levels need to continue to create environments that prevent youth from vaping by strengthening regulatory frameworks and policies that restrict access and availability and reduce the appeal of vaping products to youth. While uh, some of the other provinces are trying to play catch up with what's happened with advertising and promotion of vaping products, um, Northwest Territories has anticipated these problems and is at the head of the line to prevent um, some of the things we're seeing in other jurisdictions. At tab five, Physicians for a Smoke-Free Canada issued a press release just a, a few days ago. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, stating that until a more comprehensive ban on vaping ads is in place, Health Canada can nonetheless ensure that there is an end to misleading lifestyle and testimonial ads and that products with high youth appeal are removed from the market. And if I could just take you back to the third tab from the heart and stroke at page four. Um, <clears throat> sales and marketing of e-cigarettes. In Canada, it is illegal for manufacturers to make a health claim regarding an e-cigarette product's ability to aid in smoking cessation or to suggest that it is a safer alternative to smoking traditional combustible tobacco unless the statements are authorized by Health Canada. Now, the last, the last tab, six. Um, as part of the recent um, addiction survey conducted by the government. Um, there was a survey of vaping use uh, and these are preliminary findings and it's a draft analysis but you'll see at page one that e-cigarettes that were used most, most often contained nicotine, 56%. Curiosity was the top reason for using e-cigarettes, not cessation. Youth have the highest rates of e-cigarette use among the population, and overall NWT use is similar to the current Canadian rates. At the next page, you'll see laid out uh, that curiosity is um, the leading reason for using e-cigarettes. Um, for it being less harmful 22% of the time, or to help quit smoking 21% of the time, that it can be used in places where you can't smoke is for 21% of the time, and that they like the flavor 20% of the time. Um, so you will see that 15.5% 15, 15 of participants have tried e-cigarettes, but from that group, the 15 to 24 year age range was the highest consumer of these cigarettes with 30, 33%. 
Uh, with regard to the public places and uh, the definition or how the regulations may end up uh, listing these things, we want to emphasize that any location where children uh, converge um, should most certainly be included, and that would include uh, such things as uh, public events, which often receive an exemption sometimes. So uh, we would like to have that uh, Concerned, considered. Um, also, with regard to the regulatory, I'm sorry, I don't have that. We would like, it would be useful to have a, uh, a review period in the legislation. 13 years have gone by since the last legislation, and although there is the ability there for uh, re renewal and change, there's no timeline on it, um, and it would be good to have some sort of time for things to be reviewed and updated, and we're suggesting five years. Thank you for all your time today. appreciate this Thank opportunity. You, if you have any questions. Uh, uh, first one, th your presentation, can we get a copy of that? Um, I can provide you a written submission which will incorporate what I've said today. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mar Ms. Martinez? Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So just from uh, I think what I heard tonight, you'll have at least two specific ch uh, changes that you're going to recommend to uh, the bills. One, to uh, increase the uh, legal consumption age to 21. And secondly, to um, uh, in, include a regular review period for the legislation. Is there any other changes that you may be recommending? Thanks, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Ms. Martinez. Um, would would like to see um, as as broad a prohibition on on smoking as there can be, especially where children are present. Um, it's not really clear in the definition. We're waiting for what the regulations are going to say. So at that time, we'd probably have further comments or recommendations to make. Thank you, Ms. Martins. Mr. Riley? Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming, Ms. Martins. Yeah, uh, we have uh, Ms. Case up first. Because we have Ms. Case, we have... Uh, Mr. Hagen and then Mr. Cunningham. So, Ms. Case. Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Cheryl Case, and I'm president for the NWT Nunavut Public Health Association, and that is who I represent tonight. Health Canada recently stated, vaping is intended to help smokers quit tobacco. Vaping is not for youth and non-smokers. Vaping is not harmless, yet Canadian teens are trying vaping products. Data from a recent Health Canada survey showed that 23% of students in grades 7 to 12 have tried an electronic cigarette. Kelly Crow, a reporter for CBC, stated, according to his numbers, Dr. Hammond, Canadian teenage <coughs> vaping rates have increased substantially, similar to the dramatic increase in the United States, where rates shot up by 80% in one year, a trend the FDA called epidemic. She is referring to Dr. David Hammond, a researcher from the University of Waterloo, who stated, youth vaping has increased dramatically. His research is in press with the British Medical Journal, so we should have access to that in months. In the Northwest Territories Statistics 2018 Tobacco, Alcohol and Drug Survey, they reported 33.5% of our population 
15 years and older smoke. Stats Canada survey done in 2015 reported 13.0% of the Canadian population 15 years and older smoke. Although there is a three-year range between the two surveys, it is evident that our smoking rate in those 15 years and older is substantially higher in the Northwest Territories, and it probably is two times the rate still if they were both done in the surveys were done in the same year. In a 2000 public, 2008 publication, Youth Smoking in the Northwest Territories, a descriptive summary of smoking behavior among grades 5 to 9 students reported. The major finding was that youth tobacco use continues to be a larger public health and social problem in the Northwest Territories, with prevalence well above the Canadian survey. Our government's or public's aim is curbing the initiation of smoking for our youth. Fact. If youth do not start smoking at a young age, then it is more unlikely they will take up smoking as they become older. Health Canada published a report in 2017 called Seizing the Opportunity, the Future of Tobacco Control in Canada, stating 82% adult smokers smoked their first cigarette by the age of 18. Our mother organization, the Canadian Association of Public Health, CPHA, made the following recommendations in their position statement for nicotine containing vaping devices. Establish a legal age for the purchase of nicotine-containing vaping devices in line with that for tobacco products. The NWT and Nunavut Public Health Association supports Bill 41 that allows commercial access to all vaping products and devices, which we assume also include non-nicotine vaping substances to those 19 years and over. Apply restrictions based on toxicity on the flavors and carrying fluid used in vaping devices. At this time, with limited research, we are unclear of the toxicity produced from heating the substances used for vaping. Limit the use of flavors that could be appealing to children and youth. Again, I do not believe our legislation will allow access to non-nicotine flavored substances for those under 19 years. We would like to caution territorial accessibility to non-nicotine and nicotine substances with flavors such as candy flavors, fruit flavors, menthol, that might be tempting to our youth. Develop and implement regulations and guidelines that address safety concerns associated with the manufacture of these products. The NWT Nunavut Public Health Association believes this statement would be best addressed uh, with our Canadian Food and Drugs Act. What do we not know? Some cautionary statements regarding vaping devices. Their effect on health as it relates to particulate emissions and carcinogens, notably 1,3-butadine in nicotine. A lot is still unknown about that. Comparative toxicity with nicotine-containing vaping devices <coughs> compared to tobacco products. We need to know more research um, to, to be able to make more informed decisions. Evidence supporting the use of nicotine containing vaping devices for smoking cessation is, um, is still um, <coughs> it's lacking evidence and uh, it needs more research to be done. We need to learn more about the societal influences that lead youth and adolescents to start using nicotine containing products. Specific statements related to Bill 40, Smoking Control and Reduction Act. Our association is pleased to see the age restriction increased to 19 years, in line with our alcohol and cannabis legislation. Thank you for restricting secondhand smoke exposure to our minors in vehicles. As a child, I experienced many drives with my father as he drove and smoked, and I inhaled in the back seat. So thank you. We also appreciate more restrictions on public smoking areas. In time, with concentrated health promotion efforts, enforcement and public ac uh, acceptance, we hope <coughs> this will influence lowering our smoking rates among our youth and our population at large. 
specific statements related to Bill 41, Tobacco and Vaping Products Control Act. We need clarification regarding e-substance and the proposed regulation in the definition section. Does e-substance include flavored nicotine and non-nicotine vaping substances? We would like more definition included in the regulation regarding flavors for nicotine and non-nicotine containing e-substances. We suggest restricting commercial access to flavors that might be appealing to youth, such as candy, fruit, and menthol. As well, in Article 6, 2D, it refers to if a, if a pharmacy is located within the establishment directly or by means of a corridor or area used exclusively for such a connection, will this affect pharmacies in grocery stores? Um, so I've, I've stated points, but I've also raised questions. I don't know if they can be answered today with your committee, but... so. I end here and am open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Case. Committee, any questions for Ms. Case? Mr. Riley. Uh, thanks. Yeah, we just heard from the Canadian Cancer Society suggesting uh, an age limit of 21. You folks are saying 19. Yes. Um, care to uh, wade into that? Yes, I will. I okay, will thanks. Into that. Thank you, Mr. Early, Miss Case. It has to go through me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Miss Case. Chair. Okay. Um, I'm glad you've brought that up. Um, we met and discussed the Tobacco Act when it was called the Tobacco Act and when it was being renewed. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, our association members had agreed on 19 years of age. A lot has happened since that time, and I found out about this this, this standing committee on a few a few days ago, and I didn't have time to gather my association members together. So at this time, we say 19 years. But as I understand, uh, Mr. Chair, I do have a few weeks to still send submit submissions in writing. So if I I will be talking to our uh, NWT Nunavut Public Health Association members and to see if they are interested in supporting the age of 21 as minor. Thank you, Ms. Case. Mr. Riley. Yeah, thanks. And um, I guess the other, uh, another specific comment on Bill 41, you want to get this uh, uh, concept sorted out of what uh, the relationship of a pharmacy to uh, um, other areas, and I'm uh, within maybe even a grocery store. I'm thinking of the co op here where <laughs> the uh, pharmacy is going to be built right in the middle of the store. And I don't know whether there's going to be any physical separation between the uh, pharmacy part of the, the, the co-op and the rest of the retail space. Uh, and I, is that the sort of thing you want to get at, is to better understand what the relationship is between the pharmacy space and uh, the retail space? Thank you, Mr. Riley. Ms. Case. Um, your example is exactly what made me um, pose that question. Okay, thank you, Ms. Case. Okay, any? Thank you. Yeah, welcome, Mr. Riley. Anything? Any other further questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Ms. Case. Could I just add one comment before I leave? And that would be: I would like to have um, some clarification um, added to e-substances. What? what that means. Does it include nicotine or not nicotine when they talk about vaping products and substances? Thank I just you. wanted to reiterate that. So thank, thank you. you. Ms. Thank you, Ms. Case. Uh, next up, Mr. Hagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. My name is Les Hagan. I'm the Executive Director of Action on Smoking and Health. And ASH is based in Edmonton, and we are Western Canada's leading tobacco control organization. For over 30 years, ASH has provided local, regional, and national leadership on tobacco use prevention and reduction. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta School of Public Health, and the School of Public Health provides core funding and research uh, support for the Institute of Circumpolar Health Research, which is based here in Yellowknife. On behalf of ASH, I applaud your government for introducing Bills 40 and 41. 
If fully implemented, these bills will have a significant impact on the quality of life and they will help to keep many young people tobacco free. I also applaud the efforts of your territorial health officials and the local NGOs for all of their hard work and diligence in supporting the development of these bills. The rates of tobacco use in the Northwest Territories are among the highest in Canada and these bills will help to reduce and prevent tobacco use and to reduce the burden of tobacco use on the quality of life and the healthcare system. The use of vaping products among Canadian youth, as you've heard, have skyrocketed in recent years and Juul and Vipe have become two of the most popular vaping products among teens. These stealth vaping devices are even easy to conceal, even in a classroom. They contain candy and fruit, fruit flavorings and they deliver relatively high doses of nicotine compared to traditional vaping devices. There's emerging evidence suggesting that the explosion in youth vaping may be contributing to higher youth smoking rates in Canada. It is certainly logical to anticipate that increased nicotine addiction among youth could contribute to increased tobacco use. Imagine an addicted youth who runs out of vaping pods and finds cigarettes in the vicinity. Do you think that the youth would be tempted to smoke these cigarettes to satisfy his or her addiction? As you know, we have a new federal vaping law that came into effect last May to regulate the sale, advertising and production of vaping products. Unfortunately, this legislation does not provide adequate protection for Canadian youth and it is riddled with loopholes and omissions. We call it the Swiss Cheese Act. Despite loud objections from health organizations, the federal government created separate rules for the promotion of vaping and vaping products act. The act prohibits any form of tobacco promotion except what is permitted in the act and the regulations and there are very few things permitted. In sharp contrast, the act allows any form of vaping promotion that is not specifically banned in the act or regulations. Unfortunately, this legislation has given vaping companies a green light to widely promote their products to millions of Canadian youth through television, social media, retail promotions, print advertising, and other media channels. We have all witnessed the rampant and blatant advertising of vaping products over the past year, and millions of Canadians, millions of Canadian children and youth have been exposed to these massive promotions. Health Canada is now in the process of trying to close the barn door by placing regulatory restrictions on the promotion and advertising of vaping products. However, this process will take at least two years and the horses have already left the barn and they are now galloping at full speed toward our kids. We encourage your government to close the federal loopholes and to align restrictions on the sale and promotion of vaping products with those on tobacco promotions. Yellowknife can act much quicker than Ottawa to provide protection to northern youth that the federal government will not. Protection delayed is protection denied. A recent national poll of 3,000 Canadians conducted by Ledger Research revealed that five out of six Canadians support equal restrictions on the promotion and advertising of tobacco and vaping products. The support was evenly distributed across Canada. The same survey found that seven out of 10 Canadian Canadians supported urgent action to curtail the use of vaping products by children and youth. One of the most effective measures to reduce the use of tobacco and vaping products among youth would be to raise the minimum age of purchase to 21. 14 U.S. states have increased the minimum age of tobacco purchases to 21 in the past three years. There is very strong evidence from the Institute of Medicine and others that a minimum age of 21 could have a profound impact on youth smoking. Desperate situations call for strong measures and northern youth need all the help they can get to remain tobacco free and nicotine free for life. We hope that you will strongly consider approving this measure. We also encourage you to ban all remaining forms of flavored tobacco. Although the federal government has banned flavored cigarettes and cigarillos, they did not ban flavors in smokeless tobacco and pipe tobacco, including shisha. Several provinces have banned these products and we hope that you will provide northern youth with the same level of protection. We also encourage you to consider restricting flavors in vaping products. We further recommend that you include a clause as you've heard already uh, for an automatic five-year review in these bills as Alberta and other provinces have done. 
13 long years have passed since the Tobacco Act was passed, and this is far too long given all of the rapidly changing dynamics of the tobacco and vaping markets. We also urge you to align restrictions on the smoking and vaping of any substance, as you are doing, and to extend these restrictions to all outdoor areas where children gather, including parks, playgrounds, and public ev events. This is not yet specified in, in, the, in the Act. The use of vaping products model smoking behavior to kids. To a five-year-old, smoking is smoking, whether it involves a pipe, a cigar, a joint, a vaping device, or a cigarette. Research tells us that the more smoking impressions that a child is exposed to as they grow up, the more likely they are to become smokers themselves. Modeling is an essential element of childhood development. If we model healthy behaviors to kids, we are more likely to produce healthy kids and vice versa. The explosive rise in vaping has the potential to renormalize smoking in public places. Smoking bans are a cornerstone of the overall effort to reduce tobacco use, and they have reduced the social acceptability of smoking. NWT in Manitoba were the first two subnational governments in Canada to create smoke-free workplaces in 2004. It would be a terrible shame if this progress was impaired or reversed. Many young people are using vaping devices for clouding competitions and vape tricks that are often posted online. The visible emissions from vaping products are almost indistinguishable from smoking, especially to a five-year-old child. Kids deserve to be protected from exposure to any form of smoking or vaping in public places. Personally, I find it more than a little creepy that several Juul representatives have come all the way up to Yellowknife to oppose measures to protect kids in the territories from vaping. That's what's happening here tonight. Juul is a slick and sophisticated $15 billion marketing machine that is 35% owned by Philip Morris, the world's largest tobacco company. Tobacco and vaping companies should not be dictating public health in the Northwest Territories or anywhere in Canada, and they should not be allowed to make a bad situation even worse. I hope that the committee members will see through the smoke screen and will stop these companies from pushing their addictive and harmful products to kids by approving the strongest possible measures at your disposal. These companies are making a killing from youth smoking and vaping and they will continue to do so until they are stopped. To conclude, Ash believes that northern youth deserve first class protection from tobacco use and nicotine addiction. Northern youth should not be placed at a further disadvantage than kids living south of 60. These kids already have enough challenges to overcome and they need all the help they can get to remain smoke free. Your government can be a leader in protecting children and youth from these harmful and addictive products. We urge you to rise to this life-saving challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hagan. Um, can we get a copy of your presentation um, after this. Okay, thank you. Uh, committee, any questions? Mr. Hagan? No questions? Thank you, Mr. Hagan. Um, oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Hagan. Uh, Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hay, do you have um, analysis of the Federal Vaping Act that you could share with us. I do. Uh, thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Hagan. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I do, and I will share it with the committee. Okay, thank you. Thank Ms. You Green, that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hagan. Um, th we appreciate your time. Um, Mr. Cunningham.
Okay, uh, Mr. Cunningham, thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rob Cunningham. I'm a lawyer and senior policy analyst with the Canadian Cancer Society National Office, and it's a, a privilege for me to be with you here tonight. Um, we strongly support both bills, 40 and 41, from a public health perspective. Commend <coughs> Minister Abernathy uh, for bringing them forward. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some background with respect to e-cigarette promotion, and then also discuss some proposed amendments to the bills. Um, this handout that you have, uh, I'm just going to go through it. Um, and the first slide, it shows um, uh, trends in e-cigarette use in Canada. And we see a tremendous increase from 8.9% to 14.6%. This is from the Canadian Student Tobacco, Alcohol and Drug Survey. And that's even before the major tobacco companies in 2018 launched their own brands of e-cigarettes and started to advertise and promote heavily. So we're very concerned about further increases in 2018. The next slide, next page, it shows how um, the combined use of smoking and e-cigarettes, the total is on the increase among youth. So it's not like there's a substitution. The aggregate of nicotine use by, by teenagers is on the increase. Of course, that's of concern. The next slide shows some promotions in the United States from Juul, where they've been in the market for several years uh, before they're in Canada. And these are very youth-oriented ads. A and this is a company that dominates the teenage vaping market in the United States. They're under investigation by the Food and Drug Administration for marketing to underage youth. And that is no surprise, given these ads that you see from Juul. If you turn the page, you see more. Again, young people. So this is not you know, at all aligned with the testimony that this Kirk committee heard this evening. This next slide, and it's just the final example of more dual ads. Again, you know, very youth-oriented. I mean, this is a company that's also paid social media influencers, young people, to, to actually use these on Facebook posts and so on. Next slide is some Vipe ads. So Vipe is a brand that was launched by Imperial Tobacco um, in the spring of 2018. And this is Facebook ads. Again, very uh, appealing to youth lifestyle ads. Uh, next slide. These would be some Vipe ads on Instagram. <laughs> really, what is the real intent of these companies with scantily clad women promoting Vipe? Uh, that's a young audience that they're after. That's classic tobacco industry advertising. The next slide shows television advertising for Vipe. These are stills, extracts from TV ads. Again, lifestyle images. Next slide, next page. This is just very recently in April outside a shopping mall in Toronto, Eden Center, and you had this promotion with young women in silver outfits. It's, these are, again, lifestyle messages. Um, and if we're not careful, if we were to listen to the representations from Vibe that they made tonight in terms of weakening the bill, these, these type of promotions would be legal in their office territories, and we don't want that. And I'll continue with, with retail promotion. So on, page, on this slide 11 here, we have some examples in Ontario of retail promotion before Ontario legislation came into effect. And you, you have on the left a six-foot-high sign in a convenience store where kids may buy chocolate bars or soft drinks or potato chips. And now they're on the door, and you have an ad on the right. The ad beside it is for Doritos. Uh, again, kids are exposed to these. Next slide. Slide 12. Again, a large six-foot-high ad standing on the floor in a convenience store. We have eight provinces in Canada that have e-cigarette legislation. The two that don't at the moment are Alberta and Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan government says they're working on it. You know, it just, you know, it just takes time. So I expect legislation in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, in the same way that the Northwest Territories is now getting its legislation uh, adopted. But you see in Saskatchewan, there's a countertop display uh, uh, for Vibe right above the Skittles candy. Next slide. We see in Ontario um, 
a flyer on the countertop right beside the O'Henry and Reese's chocolate bars and chocolate products. Or on the right, um, Vibe, right above the Kit Kat chocolate bars. I mean, kids should not be exposed to promotions of this nature. Next page, we just have these large ads uh, out as people walk into a convenience store in Ontario. Now, Ontario, so all of the eight provinces of e-cigarette e legislation have banned displays in stores and have exceptions for specialty vape stores. Ontario, under pressure, um, they are allowing some advertising, which created a loophole. Health groups didn't recommend it, but you know there's a recommend. They 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 were scummed to the pressure, and here's what happened. On the left is before the legislation, and you have a display for a Vite product, and then uh, on the left, it's actually it looks like a product display. It's really just a piece of paper. <laughs> it's an it's a piece of paper showing a product. So even though actual products are just banned, they make it look like a display by having a, an ad. So these companies are very creative with loopholes if we're not careful. Next slide. Here's a, you know, a recent ad in Ontario with this huge power advertising behind the counter for, for, for Juul and for Logic and for Vipe. Uh, these are very large when any kid is buying a product. And that shouldn't be the, the case. And we continue. Uh, just The next slide is Saskatchewan. Just more displays near the candy and gum. And Alberta. Same thing, um, and then and then look at the next slide. Toronto Union Station. So that you know, again, it's a public place. The kids are exposed to. They may take tra public transit to go to school, and you have very significant promotions. Um, and then uh, the next slide is a truck on the street uh, that can go anywhere. They've been outside campuses in Ontario, and they have promotions. And then you have a sponsorship for Drake. Well, we may have seen Drake for the Toronto Raptors uh, by basketball games. Well, here he is in promotions uh, associated with Vipe. And uh, they have a tremendous marketing creativity. So I think that's important background uh, for you as legislators to ensure legislation doesn't have loopholes and is not weakened and is do what we can to protect kids. With respect to the second handout that you have, I just wanted to discuss some of the proposed amendments. And one of these is to have minimum age of 21. And you've heard other witnesses make this recommendation. It's a very good one. It's an opportunity for uh, the Northwest Territories to be the first in Canada to do it. But in the past, Northwest Territories has demonstrated leadership. For example, in 1987, the, the territorial government in the Northwest Territories was the first of any federal, provincial, territorial government to ban smoking in all government workplaces so for all uh, employees. Um, in uh, 1994, the federal government, because of contraband in Ontario and Quebec area, they reduced federal tobacco taxes and five provinces lowered it. The Northwest Territories government immediately increased taxes to replace the reduction in federal taxes. That was good for public revenue in the Northwest Territories. No other province or territory did that, but that was a very good move by the Northwest Territories. And as was mentioned, on May 1st, 2004, Northwest Territories, also on the same date in Nunavut, was the first province or territory to have 100% smoke-free law for all restaurants and bars. Territory-wide, and, and and then others have followed. So again, the Northwest Territories uh, can take this step. Um, now, Jewel does support age 21. They said so uh, in Quebec, and in the side of the room uh, this evening, uh, 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 Ms. Foster mentioned uh, that Jewel would support amendment to this bill for age 21. Now, with your permission, Chair, I could ask, on the record, Ms. Foster to confirm that if that would be of interest. Mr. Kennedy, um, she did make a presentation and we did hear that. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so I think this is an effective measure to, re to, to protect youth and to reduce youth vaping and youth smoking. Um, it's inevitable and the sooner it's implemented, the sooner it's going to have a positive impact. The second measure would be to ban flavored tobacco products. At least to have regulatory authority for there to be regulations to do that. We have a whole series of other provinces that have already taken action in this area, uh, but this is not in the bill at all. It's just, I think, an oversight. And it, it'd be good for there to be regulatory authority, for example, to ban uh, flavored water pipe tobacco, flavored um, uh, uh, chewing tobacco and snuff, as other provinces have done. The federal government has, a, has done it for cigarettes, most cigars, but not all cigars. 
um, and a, a product called blunt rasp. But any other tobacco product is not covered. So that would be a very important measure uh, to include in this bill and be straightforward in terms of regulatory authority. The third uh, recommendation would be just to prohibit um, lower prices if you buy more. For example, it's a common marketing practice. If you buy a, two packs of cigarettes, you get them for less on average than if you buy one at a time. Well, why would we want to encourage lower prices for tobacco products? Lower prices encourage consumption. They undermine the benefits of higher tobacco taxes. So I think that'd be a very easy measure. You just can't lower prices by selling a greater quantity. Um, I think that would be a, a straightforward measure uh, that could be done. And then the final measure, in, in parts inspired by the Yukon, where they have a measure for, um, for post-secondary institutions, in addition to secondary and, and elementary schools, is to prohibit all tobacco use on those premises. So right now, um, uh, you know, there could be a measure to ban smoking, but it wouldn't apply to chewing tobacco or snuff. So that is the case for elementary and secondary schools in the Northern Territories, but not, for example, like hockey rinks or baseball diamonds or uh, where we know that young male athletes are they're often using smoking, smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco or stuff. So to have regulatory authority to cover that scenario. And we know that there's more places in North America that are um, not allowing uh, chewing tobacco on uh, baseball stadiums or fields and so on because of the association with that sport. And also males and hockey, you know, in various parts of Canada, that's an, an issue. And certainly uh, smokeless tobacco use in the Northwest Territories is much higher among youth than among the, for the Canadian average. So those would be uh, recommendations uh, to consider. We have provided uh, legislative text uh, to facilitate your consideration with respect to amendments to the bill. Those would be our, uh, our, our, our representations this evening. Would, would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Any questions for Mr. Cunningham? Ms. Green. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a question of clarification. Uh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong bill. Okay, just a second. Oh, okay. That's fine. No, I, I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Green. Any other questions for Mr. Cunningham? Well, seeing none, Mr. Cunningham, thank you very much for taking the time to present. Um, we have... No, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Stevenson and Miss Drew. Mr. Stevenson, who's going to? Are you guys tag teaming or? Tag team. Okay, so just point to her when she's ready to go, and then I'll. Thank you, Mr. Thank Stevenson. You, Mr. Chair, my name is uh, John Stevenson. I'm chairperson for Yellowknife Education District Number One. <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to add us on to your agenda tonight, and thank you for the work you're doing to bring this uh, legislation forward to um, address a, a very significant health <clears throat> concern in society and in, in general. But you're focusing on the Northwest Territories, and as we heard from a previous speaker, Mr. Cunningham, uh, Northwest Territories has been a lead in many ways. I can remember well in 1987 working in the government when all of a sudden my workplace became smoke free. It was such a gift. I can remember well coming home from a bar and leaving my coat on the railing outside because it would be just polluted with smoke and then the government changed things and we were able to go into a restaurant and a bar and enjoy a meal or a drink <coughs> without the pollution of, of cigarette smoke. So uh, we're leaders here in the Northwest Territories in so many ways. We're a small jurisdiction. We can move quickly and nimbly on, on different things that other jurisdictions can't do. So I, um, as a um, group of legislators, uh, when you came to office, you, you set yourself some priorities, and one of them was uh, healthy lifestyles uh, with some key messages of... Uh, uh, healthy lifestyles and focusing on wellness and prevention. Similarly, in uh, YK1 at the school board, we have four pillars to our strategic plan. We have academic achievement, we have uh, 
inclusive education, indigenous education, and we have healthy lifestyles. So it's certainly a, a tenant, a pillar of our uh, work as a school board to promote uh, health uh, in our schools. And YK1, we're responsible for 2,100 students from junior kindergarten to grade 12. So that's a significant number of people in our community that we share in the responsibility for their education as well as their health and wellness. And as we heard from other speakers, and I, I, I am not a, a professional, I don't have the ability to speak to you about all the uh, details of, of disease and the harm of smoking, but uh, chronic disease is one of the number one uh, killers of people and cause of disability worldwide, and that's something I saw in the the World Health Organization, and it's increasing. And uh, there are a number of risks that as people we can reduce, and one of them is smoking. We can reduce the risk of impact of smoking by, as individuals, by not smoking, or as legislators putting some control onto, uh, onto the access to, to, uh, to smoke. So with any risk, there are a number of components that we uh, that we have to deal with, whatever that risk might be. So we uh, we educate people, we we try to make things safe, and we make make rules. And so that's what's in front of you now is this legislation to make some rules for our jurisdiction to provide guidance for for all of us on the the consumption of of uh, uh, another. Um, analogy that I will close with, but I, I do want to turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Tina Drew. So uh, Tina is the uh, vice chair for, for YK1. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Ms. Drew. Um, so I would like to recommend that you change the age from 19 to 21. And part of the reason is not all kids finish high school at 18. Many stay longer, they take extra classes at night for many reasons. Bullying is always a source of worry for us trustees. And when a child turns 19, there will be many kids who will want to try cigarettes, alcohol, whatever. And those kids are at risk of bullying. We have a very successful program at Route 51 at YK1 where we encourage children who have dropped out of high school to come back to finish their education. It's been very successful. We want those kids to feel welcomed and not pressured. I would totally recommend that we raise the age from 19 to 21. Secondly, <clears throat> I'm a nurse. <clears throat> I'm actually the urology nurse, or most people like to call me the PP queen. <laughs> it's well known what I do. Bladder cancer is the most expensive cancer in the country to treat. Most people don't know that. Because once you get bladder cancer, it's like a dandelion. It never totally goes away. It can pop up at any time. So you end up having to go to a hospital to have a cystoscope every year for the rest of your life. If it comes back, you come back to see me four times a year. And then six, every six months and then every year. When we talk about smoking sensation, I went down to Alberta, I talked to respirologists there. The most successful form of smoking sensation is not to tell people to quit, tell people to postpone. Do you have to have that cigarette right now or can you wait 10 minutes? When you tell people to quit, that's a very hard task. But when you tell them they only have to wait 10, 15 minutes until they can have a cigarette, often they get occupied and their smoking decreases dramatically during the day. This is not done on any studies, but the respirologist in the University of Alberta Hospital, this is what they recommend that we start teaching people. They say the products don't always help because they give you nicotine in another form, which is still addictive. Postponing is something that people can do. Ten minutes is not a long time. Sorry. About that. Um, postponing is not a hard thing for people to do. You're not telling them that today they're going to be a failure if they pick up a cigarette tomorrow. 
You're just giving them 10 minutes to do something else. Secondly, we all talk about the mortality of cigarettes. We forget about the morbidity of cigarettes. The morbidity of cigarettes is awful. Peripheral vascular disease, you might lose your leg, then you lose your other leg. You can live a long time with peripheral vascular disease, but it's very expensive to treat in hospital situations. Lastly, I'd like to speak as a mother. <coughs> I've got to show <coughs> on my phone. The first time I found a little vape container <coughs> when my sons had friends over, it was strawberry watermelon pop. How exciting that sounded. Sunrise pressed e-juice, blue raspberry pop, pink lemonade risky. I didn't know that these had nicotine in them. I was very innocent on that. And I have talked to my kids about smoking, and they t told me, this isn't smoking. And I said, well, let's look up the ingredients and what you're getting. For a lot of kids, vaping is not seen as smoking. And so nicotine addiction is built in these kids before they realize they even have a substance that they can be addicted to. I truly believe that addictions can be genetic. I come from Ireland. We've got very high <coughs> alcoholics and people with addictions. And it has been studied, and they said that we have a weakened gene. So for my kids to be taking these products, <clears throat> I feel really threatened that they're now going to be smokers. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Ms. Drew. Mr. Stevenson. Thank you. Just a closing um, analogy. And so that's to do with uh, ice. So in the fall, in the early winter, when the lakes start to freeze, um, we're always keen to get out on the ice for skating or for ice fishing. And it's always tempting to get out there when it's thick enough. And there'll be some people to say, ah, oh, a couple inches is good enough. We'll get out there and go for a skate or we'll do some ice fishing. The city of Yellowknife has a website that you can go to that uh, measures the ice. They contract the local snowmobile association and they go out and measure a number of the lakes. And so you can go online and check the ice, and um, they have a conditional statement there that there is no safe ice. But they will tell you that six inches of good, clear ice will support you and support a snow machine to go on, on the ice. But they make a very strong statement there that they're not telling you that the ice is, is safe. Uh, one of the tricks that uh, we have when we go out on the ice is we make a measuring stick. So we take a piece of uh, wood and we drive a nail in it and then we can stick it down in the hole that we cut and that's an easy way to measure the ice and what I always do is I make uh, one inch marks there so I can tell when I've got, got a, how much ice I've got before I venture out on the on the lake <clears throat> so it's a very handy way to measure the ice well similar to ice there's no safe smoke there's no safe place there's no safe way there's no safe product when it comes to, to smoking. We're not going to eliminate it. Uh, we're not going to prohibit uh, all smoking, but we have made strides to, uh, to improve our work environment, our, our public spaces, and I believe through your next steps in legislation you can do things to improve the safety of uh, smoke products in our community, in our society, in the Northwest Territories. And so I urge you to make a legislative stick, kind of like what I make for measuring the ice. And, but make the, make the marks long there. Don't, two inches is not enough, so don't go for the, the shallower, just enough bit of legislation. Go for the, the thicker, denser legislation that will, will provide uh, long-term uh, substantial protection for uh, our communities, for our society, and particular for our youth. I have a big focus on, on our kids. That's where we can have the most impact on, on uh, their futures is by educating them uh, and through legislation limiting access. So I encourage you to, to uh, err on the side of health, wellness, healthy lifestyles as you go through this legislation 
in your committee and when it eventually makes it in the in the house so i thank you very much we do not have a, a written presentation but i do thank you for the opportunity for an audience here from a, a group that does uh, have a fair bit to do with youth in the community thank you mr stevenson any questions for mr stevenson or mr miss green thank you uh, my question uh, for john is about um vaping on school property uh, I'm going to ask you to confirm that it's not legal, but how often does it happen where where the vaping product is, is confiscated from the youth? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, that's not data that I have uh, at hand. If that was something that the committee wished, I could uh, could ask the uh, principal of the high school for some, some comments on that, but I, I don't have data on uh, on the incidence of vaping in the, in the, in the schools. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you. Yeah, if you could, uh, if you could ask the principal to comment on how often these products are are um, found and confiscated, or whatever the disposal of the products is, uh, that that might give us an idea of how much uptake there is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Stevenson. I can certainly do that. And how would I convey that to the committee? To so I'll get your contact when before I leave. Thank you. Any, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for coming this evening. Um, while you talk to the principal, uh, I was wondering if you might talk to the the uh, student council as well to see whether they have any views on uh, uh, student vaping and uh, if those might be passed along as well. I'd, I'd be curious to know how the students view this and if what they'd like to see done. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Stevenson. Certainly, I can add that to uh, the questions. I, I will convey those through our uh, superintendent to the uh, principal of the high school. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Mr. O'Reilly. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Stevenson or Ms. Drew? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, Ms. Ms. Drew, Comment. go yeah. ahead. So one of the things that, too, we were talking about with vaping is the flavors in vaping are also um, uh, problematic. They do cause an increase of heart disease. And that has been studied at the Stanford University. So it's not just if there's nicotine in them. The flavors and the chemicals used also can cause um, harm. And I can get you that study if you would like. Uh, Ms. Drew, I would greatly appreciate if you could get that uh, study to us. Yes, thank you. And to uh, Ms. Frankie Smith here. Yeah. She'll get the uh, information to you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Drew. Any other comments? Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to speak to committee? <laughs> uh, seeing none. If there are no further comments or presentations from the public, do members agree that this agenda item is concluded? Agreed. Thank you, committee. <coughs> On behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here today as MLAs. It's a privilege to be here to hear directly from you. When we make our report in the Legislative Assembly, we'll highlight the feedback we received during these meetings and from other public submissions. If you still have questions about the bill or want to make a written submission, please talk to the committee clerk. Um, and you can also visit our website at www.assembly.gov.nt.ca. I will now adjourn this part of the public meeting and ask the committee to sit back or wait back until the public leaves and so we can have a wrap-up. Thank you.